Hello, this is Anthony Effinger, host of the Think Neuro podcast from Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Today, I'm talking with Dr. William Buxton. He's PNI's Director of Neuromuscular and Neurodiagnostic Medicine and Fall Prevention. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Buxton. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me to meet with you today. So first, tell us what neuromuscular and neurodiagnostic medicine is. So neuromuscular medicine is below-the-neck neurology. So it's the study of an assessment of and treatment of disorders of the spine, nerves, and muscles. It includes a wide range of things from diabetic nerve damage to spinal cord infections to wear and tear that happens in the neck and back to myasthenia gravis, to ALS. So a wide wide range of disorders that really impact people's ability to live their lives and and get to work and interact with other people. So is that anything neurological outside the brain then? Correct. Uh, Neurology is brain, nerves, spine, and muscles. And uh, neuromuscular medicine is almost everything below, below the brain. Okay. And what you said, neurasthenia gravis, did I hear you correctly? Myasthenia gravis. It's a a not uncommon condition in which the immune system, for whatever reason, starts attacking the receptors for acetylcholine, which is the chemical, the neurotransmitter released by nerves that activates muscles. So muscles that have to work hard and frequently during the day, like the eyelids and the quadriceps and calves, get tired and fatigued easily. If you have that disorder. Correct. Interesting. How did you become interested in this field? So uh, neurology attracted me early on in medical school just because it's the field that really addresses disorders that keep people from being able to be active in life. Uh, So I really saw in neurology an opportunity to help people walk better, think better, talk better, uh, use their hands better and engage in daily life activities who would ordinarily be hampered by by their disorders. Uh, And then with regards to uh, nerve and muscle problems, I found it especially appealing in that that's the field that keeps people uh, from engaging in work and walking and exercise more than anything else. So, and it's really one field that is hard for patients to conceal when they are around other people. So uh, it's really limiting, the disorders are really limiting in terms of uh, people's daily lives and really see opportunities that in every visit, there's always something we can do as simple as sending out a nurse to to check out home safety or setting up physical or occupational therapy to as complex as chemotherapy that really help that part of the nervous system work better and help people be able to live their lives better. What are sort of the top five um, things you see in your clinic? So the thing I see most is probably peripheral neuropathy, which in developed countries is most commonly caused by diabetes with alcohol being the second most common cause. It's where the nerves starting usually in the feet and then in the hands and then they send don't work as well as they should. So people get a sense of numbness in their hands and feet, have trouble feeling things. Uh, Over time, it starts to affect larger nerves that let us feel where our hands and feet are in space, which can throw off balance. Um, And then most eventually start affecting motor neurons, which are nerves that activate muscles. So people get weakness in their arms and legs. How does diabetes cause that? It's, it's probably a multifaceted process. Uh, the byproducts of sugar metabolism, when they're not cleared out well enough because somebody's got diabetes, themselves are toxic to nerves. Um, over time, there's probably an excessive amount of oxidative activity and probably a little bit of inflammation also. So it becomes a, a cascade that leads to, to nerve dysfunction and damage. And I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What else, what else do you see in your clinic? So see that, see uh, uh, myasthenia, like we talked about, where nerves and muscles don't communicate as well as they should. Uh, see spinal problems, things from uh, as, as simple as a disc bulge or bone spur impacting nerves or 
as complex as congenital problems like spina bifida that really block arms and legs from communicating with the brain because of problems in the spine. I can talk to you about some problems with the spine. <laughs> <laughs> Most people can. So at one point yeah. or another. L5 S1. <laughs> Ouch. Yep. Uh, one of the things I know you're interested in or working on, um, which is an epidemic problem among the elderly is falling. Is that right? That's correct. One, one of the things that in neurology practice, you start realizing over time that patients with really any neurologic problem or even problems with eyesight or uh, can, can really start to develop balance problems. And when those get bad enough can lead to falls, um, which I know people joke about uh, frequently. It's, it's, it's a common topic in standup in comedy TV shows, uh, but it really is a whole lot more serious than just the I've fallen and can't get up um, phrase used way, way too often. Um, and in the elderly, about one in three people over 65 fall each year. Uh, if they break their hip, a quarter of people over 65 or 70 who break their hip die within the year, uh, just because those problems, just the, a, a hip injury just leads to somebody's ability to be involved and engaged really fall apart quickly, you know, which leads to lots of other medical problems. Uh, they're costly. The direct medical expenses for most uh, falls that lead to admission are, is about $10,000 in direct costs oh. and annualized leads to tens of millions of dollars in the U.S. annually with indirect costs in terms of time off from work, time off from family members, off of work, um, and all the other indirect expenses probably reaches in hundreds of millions each year uh, just from falls in the elderly. As a neurologist, what, 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 how do you attack this? So really take a, a mind to head to toe approach um, for us to maintain good posture and, and be able to stand up on our feet. We need good vision. We need good brain function. We need good mind function. Uh, we need good inner ear function. We need intact spines uh, and skeletons to hold us up. Uh, we need good function in the nerves in our feet because those tell our brains where we are in space. And we need strong muscles to help hold us up. Uh, so we really think through, and also need a good cardiovascular system. So uh, one thing that can happen due to cardiac problems is as people stand up, uh, we lose our ability for our body to adjust blood pulls in our legs uh, and in our abdomens and doesn't get to our brain. It can make people feel lightheaded and start to have a near syncopal episode, if, if not outright faint. Uh, peripheral neuropathies can do that also because peripheral neuropathies are uh, also what make muscles on our legs clamp down when we stand up to keep our blood pressures from dropping. Um, we define, sorry, define the neuropathy. So neuropathy is, is dysfunction or damage of nerves in the peripheral nerves. So nerves coming out from the spine usually starts in the feet um, and then spreads up into the hands and then eventually higher up in the arms and legs. Uh, and is a problem that affects our ability to sense things, our ability to activate muscles, and also our ability to maintain our autonomic nervous system. So uh, our fight, fight or flight sympathetic response and our rest and digest parasympathetic responses are part of the nervous system also. Uh, so it's small, small branches of nerves that come out from the spine to the uh, blood vessels and, and internal organs and um, help keep our blood pressure from dropping, help us digest food, all, all the things that we don't have to think about throughout the course of a day um, can be affected in neuropathy as well. And as a result, um, can both directly and indirectly contribute to falls and balance problems. So you, neuropathy can affect, so neuropathy can affect um, both what you described with cardiovascular issues that could cause you to fall. Right. And also your ability to sense the ground, say with your feet, because you have nerve damage in your lower extremities. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So this is, if you attack that, then you can attack a source of a lot of falls then. Correct. 
Okay. So how do you, how do you, what do you do? So for neuropathy, we try to find the cause. Um, diabetes and alcohol are the two most common causes in developed countries. Uh, but thyroid dysfunction, vitamin B12 deficiency, um, high levels of B12, I'm sorry, high levels of B6 or low levels of B6 can cause neuropathy. Um, uh, some infections can cause neuropathy. Uh, problem, there are problems with uh, blood production uh, can indirectly cause neuropathy. Uh, and lots of medications can cause neuropathy, hmm. especially chemotherapy agents. And on the alcohol front, how much, uh, how much alcohol are we talking about here? <laughs> As a rough rule of thumb, anything more than about one alcohol equivalent a day can lead to neuropathy. So uh, anything more than a can of beer, a glass of wine, or, or a shot of hard liquor each day, we find significantly increases the risk of neuropathy. One, one unit of alcohol. Right. Wow. That's not what I expected you to say. I know. How is that new research? I've seen, I, I know it, it, it seems like mm -hmm. we're heading down the road toward no alcohol is the best. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, something that's developed over years to a few decades, just becoming increasingly aware. So when you see people come in with neuropathy from drinking, are they, are they, is that, I would consider that to be sort of moderate drinking, but I think maybe I'm wrong. So it, it's, it's in the vast uh, spectrum of, of alcohol intake, probably just moderate, but uh, we're finding it even moderate is, is less than ideal. Fascinating. How does alcohol destroy nerves like that? Uh, it's directly toxic to nerves and um, in, in terms of the alcohol itself. Um, and also just uh, also the glycosylation end products from the sugars in alcohol can contribute to neuropathy, but there's a separate effect even in people who don't have diabetes. Uh, a separate effect for people who don't have diabetes, but drink. Correct. Yeah. So it's yeah. alcohol independent of, of diabetes. Okay. So my mom's 95. She's fallen, um, many That's times. Fine. Fine. Um, yeah, she broke her hip, but she's gotten through it. She's not Good. part of that, um, statistic, thank God so far. But one of the, you know, one of the things that contributes to her problems are her medication because she's on some medications for other things that right. make her less steady on her feet. Are you, t are you, you're, I mean, I imagine you're working on that problem too. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, polypharmacy, which is necessary in, in most older individuals, uh, is an independent risk factor falls in and of itself, uh, especially more than about five or six prescription medications. It can happen from any number of, of ways, most commonly if, if they're a little bit sedating. Sedating medications, anticholinergic medications contribute to falls because they dull our sense of, of alertness and where we are in space, uh, not by causing neuropathy. Somebody who comes into your clinic has, do they, have they normally had a fall or they're concerned about falls? At what stage do you, can you get them? Uh, any stage, any stage and every stage from coming in for an unrelated problem and realizing that they've got factors that place them at risk for falls to concern for falls and feeling off balance to somebody who's had multiple falls and falls with injuries. The, the single most helpful intervention for reducing both fall and frequency is a formal physical therapy program or exercise class. Uh, they can do lots of sophisticated medical treatments, uh, but regardless of the cause, getting somebody either into a good exercise class or working with a physical therapist and following through on doing the home exercises uh, is the most consistently helpful thing in reducing frequent in reducing fr future falls. Um, so it's really the home exercises too. So a lot of people go and say they went to physical therapy and then come home and, and sit down, but gotta find a reminder. I, I will tell uh, patient spouses, don't let the patient have their breakfast till they've done their physical therapy exercises each day, which is a pretty good incentive for, for most people. So um, really doing yes. that and following through with that for, for the long haul and people are happy that they do. You have to do the PT. You can't just get the PT. You have to do the PT. Right. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. 
If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. How much success are, are you having or, and are we having as a society at getting smarter about the things that cause falls? Uh, doing pretty well. Uh, we're, we're finding that just as a clinic, we screen everyone, even if they don't at the arrival at, at the visit seem like they're at risk for falls, are screened by asking if they've had a fall recently, if they've had multiple falls, if they've injured themselves with falls. Uh, because the single strongest risk factor for a future fall is either two or more prior falls or any fall with injury. Um, and then if someone uh, has had either of those things happen, uh, the physician is alerted and encouraged to really address why the patient's falling, uh, which starts with a good history, finding out the circumstances, where people fall, do people fall walking to the bathroom at night? Do they fall in the kitchen if the floors are wet? Uh, do they fall on the throw rug in, in their foyer? Uh, do they fall when they're outside? Um, just the circumstances, do they fall after taking certain medications? So just really thinking about the circumstances and a little bit of detective work on that front and then start to examine all the things that we've talked about that contribute to falls. So uh, making sure they've had an eye exam recently, checking brainstem function, so checking eye muscle movements, uh, checking hearing, uh, checking coordination, uh, checking muscle strength, checking sensation, and checking balance, walking, watching somebody walk. How do you check brainstem function? So the, the brainstem is, is the base of the brain that, that controls basal functions that we thankfully don't have to think about, like breathing and making sure our heart doesn't speed it too much or slow down too much. Um, and it's sort of the bridge between the, the cerebrum, which is the thinking processing part of the brain, and the spine and the rest of the body. Um, and it also controls things in our face. So um, it controls eye movements, it controls pupil reaction, it controls swallowing, controls hearing, uh, so even simple things like watching somebody move their eyes, checking their hearing, uh, can be really valuable and easily done things in a physical exam, uh, that can give a good sense as to what's happening at the base of the brain. Okay. So this is nothing invasive, uh, like you're not taking fluid or anything like that. You're no, using not at all. simple tests. Yes, definitely. I had no idea. I knew falls were bad, but I had no idea they were sort of a public health emergency. And, and these, the, the numbers you cite, that's, those are, I mean, those are enormous. That's a lot, a lot of money and resources. Definitely. So, and, and we're seeing just simple interventions of asking about falls of really training our doctors and nurse practitioners to take those extra few minutes to look into the details of falls, to do a thorough neuro exam and really start to address those, um, are reducing falls. That that process ha is resulting in trends towards uh, patients falling less. Um, and even individuals with dementia who 10 years ago were sort of viewed as not capable of, of reducing falls just because they're not able to engage in good physical therapy and exercise programs. Um, this this approach can can trend towards fewer falls for them as well. I was going to ask, do you work with uh, other folks at PNI who are experts in physical therapy? Yes, definitely. Uh, we have a really truly mind to head to toe approach. So, uh, in addition to neurosurgeons, ENT doctors, ophthalmologists, um, we have dementia neurologists, we have neuropsychologists, uh, we have a personal trainer who um, is in the process of, of getting a master's in neuroscience. Uh, right now, who uh, is just a master of everything that links the body and the brain, and has exactly. a real passion for that. It, Ryan Glad is his name, and we've he, talked to Ryan. He's fantastic. He is. He is. He is really eager and passionate uh, about his work, both for the mind and the body, uh, and really bright and really resourceful and an out of the box thinker. 
Uh, so he's help, he's helping us to develop programs that involve simultaneous physical activity and cognitive activity at the same time. Uh, so uh, jumping back and forth over a stick while playing uh, number games on, on a big video screen, uh, which is actually really helpful because we know that things like that help cognitive function. We know that things like that help physical function. Uh, but there's something about doing them simultaneously that adds an additive benefit. So if you have somebody do a physical activity and then 10 minutes later do a cognitive activity, they get a little bit better, but don't have a sustained response with their improvement in cognitive functions. But if you do them simultaneously, it's an additive effect plus the plus an additional boost, uh, probably just because our blood pressure and heart rate are more um, are are high and more rapid when when we're exercising. Uh, our brain is three percent of our mass. Our brain uses twenty percent of our oxygen. So and blood flow. So just increasing that probably just gives us the extra boost to help our brain gradually over time uh, start to learn to learn better. You you use the term. Did you say mind, head, and body? Mind to head to toe, right? So mind to head to toe. Okay. So tell me about the difference between mind and head. So just thinking, uh, it, there, there's a fair amount of overlap, but, uh, but when I think of mind, I, I think of, um, more the behavior and psychology side and, um, head, head and brain more the, um, th the physical and, um, and wiring, uh, parts of our brain, the, the neurons, the, the gray matter, and then the white matter connecting it to the rest of the body. And um, uh, P and I, we, we have uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and also uh, neurologists. So we're really able to work very closely and uh, really help people optimize their, their brain and body function to help their emotional and cognitive health and vice versa. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Is there any sort of public um, information campaign or outreach to say assisted living facilities that's being done on falls? There is. There. The, it, it's. It's a a, a a focus that the National Institutes on Aging is definitely addressing. Uh, there are lots of online resources, flyers, brochures, uh, which can easily be put up in. Um, in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, uh, hospitals are really realizing the uh, the the value of fall prevention. So um, uh, they find that people in hospitals who fall stay longer in hospitals. So um, it's it's something that uh, that people are definitely starting to pay close attention to, and um, uh, at a practical level. Uh, screening for falls is is something that Medicare is uh, at, uh, at times incentivizing in terms of uh, letting doctors who are more um, mindful of, of fall prevention in hospitals who do the same um, be more eligible for bonuses at the end of the year um, is is one approach being proposed and, and looked at for the future because. Uh, in the end, it results in lower costs uh, to Medicare and to, to insurers. That would be a great step forward. Absolutely. Incenti incentivizing prevention of falls would be. Right. Seems like a no-brainer. Pardon the pun. No-brainer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what brings, how do patients find you? So from any number of means, we're, um, we're part of the Providence system in, in Southern California uh, so we, we get a lot of referrals from Providence physicians and from most other health systems in Southern California. Um, we've, we've got, a, uh, a large 30 plus doctor team in all specialties within P and I, um, and through, through, a, through a, a strong network that we've developed over the years, uh, get a lot of referrals internally. Our, our website is a great resource. Um, and with, with the help of, um, programs like yours are really able to get the word out and let people know that we're available and here and eager to help anyone who, who needs our help. 
does a doctor in your position, do you see more of the tough cases? Do you see all the cases? You must see some that have, have um, I mean, say others. We, we do. So we're, we're, a, we're a subspecialty uh, tertiary program uh, that really likes to take the approach that there's always something we can do. Uh, but if, if we can't find a reversible cause, there are always things we can do to help improve quality of life. Um, our physical therapy colleagues are mm. wonderful and, and learn a whole bunch of things and that doctors would never begin to know that um, really help people push hard, push through obstacles and are able to, to get a little bit better balance, if not considerably better balance. Um, and correct working with our internal medicine and family medicine colleagues on addressing um, medication use, on addressing other medical problems that may be contributing to the balance problems. Have you had any, have you had any cases recently that have been uh, particularly interesting where you've discovered something um, that you don't see every day? So we, we see a fair amount of, of perineoplastic conditions. Ooh, what's, what's that? Uh, it's conditions that are caused by proteins or antibodies made by tumor cells uh, that affect brain and or nerve function, um, oftentimes months to years before the cancer can manifest. Uh, so uh, it tends to cause, in particular, proprioceptive loss, so our ability to know where our, where our legs are in space. Um, or can cause behavioral problems or seizures. Uh, and they're things that we're just, that we've been aware of for 20 plus years, but o- over the last five to 10 years has really been an explosive exponential rise hmm. in identification of different antibodies. Um, and uh, so if somebody's falling, having trouble swallowing, any number of neurologic problems through uh, through work with uh, labs, have found ways to identify these proteins in blood that are made by tumors, and oftentimes find tumors months before we otherwise would have. And treating uh, the cancer usually takes care of the neurologic problems. Interesting. So these can be tumors anywhere, or are there certain types that are particularly C- certain types that that uh, are most commonly make these antibodies. Um, uh, especially lung cancer, um, is the one we see the most in our patient population usually. Wow. Okay. So then the neurological condition is a clue that there's an underlying tumor. Right. Fascinating. And you see, you're seeing a surge in these sorts of things. Uh, we're, we're becoming more able to identify and, ah. and test for them. Okay. Okay. So that's, I see. Okay. Right. Got it. Well, that's fantastic then. I mean, that every clue that you can get there is for the better. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is wonderful. I, um, I, as somebody who has a mother who's 95 years old, uh, I applaud your work. <laughs> Thank you. She, it's good to know that there are people on the job because I certainly have seen the effects of, uh, of a fall. Uh, it's traumatic for, for the uh, elderly person and at the family, it's, um, it's traumatic as well. So thank you so much for joining us. I think we'll have you back again to talk more about this. I'd I'd like that. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Buxton, thank you. You take good care.